Good afternoon. <laughs> there are times when I'm organized and there are times when I'm not organized. Um, good afternoon to everybody who is joining us on Facebook Live for Bible study this afternoon. Um, looking forward to this. I just want to do a couple of announcements just for here in the, in the congregation um, in the building. Um, the electrician will be coming, and so if you hear a knock on the door, actually let that person in. <laughs> um, and then Jackie said she was running late, so we're good for we're good for that. And, but she has a key, so. But if she all of a sudden forgets that, if you hear the knock on the door, thank you, everybody. Thank you. <laughs> um, all right. Um, it's been a couple weeks since we've been together, but um, we're continuing our exploration of the parables of Jesus. And the parable we've got for today is one that we probably automatically think we know. <laughs> it's, it's a very well-known one, um, and it's found in Matthew chapter 22, verses 1 through 14. And I'll go ahead and put that on the board. So that's Matthew chapter 22, 1 through 14. The title is usually um, the parable of the wedding banquet or the parable of the great banquet. That's what we usually find in the Gospel of Luke. I think a more apt title for the Matthew version of this, though, is The King's Son's Wedding. And you're thinking, Pastor, that's needlessly complicated, and you're enjoying that far too much. Um, but it really is more descriptive. So The King's Son's Wedding. Um, and as we go through this, you'll understand why this really works as the, um, as the title. And so, but what I want to do first, just because this is, when we think about the great banquet or the wedding feast or something like that, the, these parables, um, we often think of the version in Luke, which is a little bit more grace-oriented. Um, and this one I wanted to use today because, well, it's got some stuff that we really need to unpack. And so let me read it first, um, just so you kind of hear it and can kind of follow along. For those of you who are at home with us, that's Matthew 22, verses 1 through 14. And again, I'm going to read that because it's, the details matter. Um, and because it is a parable, we need to attend to these details. So let me do that, and then we'll get going. Matthew writes, Once more Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his slaves to call those who had been invited to the wedding banquet, but they would not come. Again, he sent other slaves saying, tell those who have been invited, look, I've prepared my dinner, my oxen and my fat calves have been slaughtered and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they made light of it and went away, one to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized his slaves, mistreated them and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent the, his troops, destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Then he said to the, his slaves, the wedding is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go therefore into the main streets and invite everyone you find to the wedding banquet. The slaves went out into the streets and gathered all whom they found, both good and bad. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing a wedding robe. And he said to him, friend, how did you get in here without a wedding robe? And he was speechless. Then the king said to his attendants, bind him hand and foot and throw him into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few 
are chosen. Okay. That's harsh. <laughs> exactly right, Claire. I mean, that's harsh. This is a harsh parable. And when you read the Lucan version of this, you're thinking, oh, I much rather prefer the Luke and Lucan's version, Luke's version, because it's not this harsh. But so clearly what we are dealing with here is something that we have to pay attention to. Um, and so we need to kind of remind ourselves a couple of things. First, this is a parable. And so Jesus is coming right out and saying, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to, right? So we know that this story is a story that Jesus is making up, right? This is not something that happened. This is a story that he is making up for the express purpose of getting into our thoughts and getting into our hearts, of making us pay attention to some really important things. So hold that, right? Sometimes when Jesus is telling stories, his stories are so good that we can get wrapped up into forgetting that sometimes they're just a story. But he's telling the story so that we will think about not just the story, there's the story, but the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, right? The parables are always trying to explain to us what the kingdom of God is like, you know, what this is supposed to be like. And so he's always making these comparisons, right? So here's a story. And he does that because he knows that we are, by nature, um, we are storytellers and we are listeners of stories. And so a story is so much easier. He could do this in highly technical theological language, right? Jesus has got all the background. He's got all the skills. He knows all the scripture where he could just go through and do this in a way that would be just as um, accurate to our understanding of the kingdom of God, but far less effective for getting us to understand, right? We do better when we hear it in a story, right? That's why we like movies. That's why we like reading books. That's why we even when we read devotionals or something like that, if somebody's got a little story that they're telling, it helps us to engage. Jesus is really good at this. He's a good storyteller. He does, Claire, exactly right. He knows human nature. He knows how to tap into the way to get us to actually think about it and then do something about it, right? Because clearly what he's, the, the waters that he's fishing in in this particular story are deep and they are profound because it's about judgment. This is about ultimately who God, you know, oh, could somebody get that? Yeah, just one moment. Yep. Somebody's at the door. I can't see who it is. <laughs> um, so it's, it's really about, you know, Who's in? Who's out? What, what does God's judgment look like? And the fascinating thing about this, though, is that, yep. Oh, all right. Oh, very good. Good timing for everybody's part. <laughs> so what we have is the story of Jesus setting the scene. The kingdom of God is like a wedding banquet, right? And so this is where the king's son's wedding. Whose wedding is this? The son. Who's putting on the banquet? The king. Okay, so who's the king? That's a really good question. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn that right back to you. Who do you think the king is? Who do you think the son is in this story? And because Jesus is not trying to make this part of it hard, you can probably sort this one out. Who's the king in this story? Puts on a banquet, invites all these people to come to the banquet in honor of his son. Yeah, it, it's, it's God and the son is Jesus. And you're thinking, okay, but Jesus never got married. Who is Jesus marrying, right? Okay, now this is the story. Who do you think Jesus is probably marrying, as it were? And, we're, and to get a hint for this, think of the book of Revelation, the wedding feast of the Lamb. 
Do you remember who Jesus marries in the book of Revelation? He's the bridegroom, and who's the bride? The church, Jackie, exactly right. The church is the bride, right? So Jesus is the bridegroom, the church is the bride, because, you know, Revelation obviously was written a good number of generations later, right? And so the church has just started. But remember, by the time the Gospels are getting written down, right, the church has started to emerge, right? There are communities that are surrounding the stories of Jesus as the Messiah. And so we have a tendency to think of the Gospels as if they're chroniclers the moment Jesus is doing these things. But that's not the case, right? Do you know why they didn't write the stories of Jesus down in that first generation? Do you, what, what do you think? Why would you not write these down? Because these don't get written down until the 50s and the 60s. Remember, Jesus dies in roughly around 33. Why don't they get written down until the 50s or the 60s or even the 70s? They had people who could write, Claire, so they, they did have that. They, they absolutely had people who could write. The question, though is, but why didn't they write them down? I mean, because think people like um, some of the people around him. Think of Matthew, the tax collector. If he's a tax collector, he can read and write, right? Because he's a well-educated, he probably spoke both um, Hebrew and Greek. He probably even spoke some Latin, right? Because he worked for the Roman Empire. And so he's a highly literate man, right? Um, and I'm going to guess that some of the others were as well. Um, Luke was a physician, right? Not in a doctor as the way we think of it today, but somebody who did take care of others. He was definitely well-versed in multiple languages. Some of the fishermen, eh, not so much. But Jesus himself was clearly well-educated. So they had people who could write, but why not write it down in that first generation? Why does it take some time before they start writing the Gospels down? And, and as soon as I say it, you're going to be like, oh, well, of course, Pastor, you're just being obtuse. Yeah. Actually, um, turn that one around. It's, it's not so much that they didn't believe that he was the Messiah, but they did. But here's the thing. Everybody, and, and I'm going to kind of give it away because it's, I think this is one of those things that we just don't think about. They don't get written down right away because everybody had firsthand knowledge. That whole first generation, they knew Jesus, right? They saw Jesus. They walked with him. They did ministry with Jesus. They didn't have to write it down because they knew the story. They were the living story. You know, so they knew what was happening. They knew it. The problem was is that writing it down was something that, A, they may not have had time to do because they were doing the ministry, but also because it's a little dangerous to write things down because now you've committed yourself to these very strong beliefs. Maybe a little bit out of fear, but I think some of it is just because they didn't need them. Okay, so why do you then write them down 20, 30 years later? Why would you do that? Why would you start writing things down then? Right. For those, yeah, exactly, Betty. For those people who are coming next, who didn't see Jesus in person, who didn't know the stories, who didn't live those stories, you got you to gotta write it down so you can pass it on. Now, a lot of this was going to be oral stories, right? They're going to tell them one generation or the next. But it is a literate culture. People can read. And so what's the easiest way to take a story or, and, and take this really vital stuff and pass it to people who live a long way away? Something written down, right? It's concrete. It's, it's, you can pass it on to the next person. There's a reason why we give Bibles to families of kids who have been confirmed or baptized or stuff like that, right? Because we don't want to assume that they've got a Bible in the house. And so we say, because we've just said to them, like we're going to do it on Sunday. This is why the baptismal font and stuff is up. We're going to baptize Amir, and we're going to say to his family, we want you to put into his hands the scripture. Well, what if they don't have one? Here you go, <laughs> right? There was, a, there was a young man who was here 
for the confirmation. And he was telling me that um, he and a friend were starting to get curious about the Bible, and they wanted to learn about it, but they didn't have one. I said, well, here, I'll give you one, right? That's what they were doing. So they were writing it down because they were that important. They wanted to share these stories, right? They wanted to share this testimony of who this Jesus of Nazareth was because they did believe him, in, right? They did believe that he was the Messiah. They believed that he was the Son of God. And so they start writing these things down. And so when Matthew is writing, right, or when the person who um, writes under Matthew's name is writing, because it was probably somebody, one of his disciples who did it, when they write these things down, Matthew, Mark, Luke, right, they're writing to communities that are already formed, right? The church is just starting at that point. And so these gospels become really, really just absolutely vital because it's all of that, so you don't have to try to remember it. It's all in the scrolls. Yeah, Claire. Oh no, this is all. These are these are post flood. This is all. This is all well after the. So this is during the time of Jesus that I'm talking about. Right, right. And so what we see is that, you know, after the flood, you've got to start over, and they do. And so you get the whole long history of the people of Israel. Yeah. But so, but at the time of Jesus, what you're going to have is you're going to have a lot of Jewish people who are going to say, yep, he's the Messiah, right? The first Christians were all Jews, right? It's really important for us to kind of wrap our brain around the fact that that they were they were they they saw Jesus as the next logical extension of God's revelation made perfect sense but then it wasn't just the Jews they were also these people we call gentiles meaning everybody who's not Jewish <laughs> and so what you're starting to do is you're starting to form these new communities and they couldn't be much bigger than well Genesis is right now right because um, they're still forming, they're still growing, and so they're developing all these things. And one of the things that they want to articulate is that Jesus, though he's not right there, physically present to them, is still present to them, right? Through the sacraments, especially communion, right? That Christ promised his presence, so it's there. But also then in the scripture itself, in the sharing of it in community. And so when we think about the king's son's wedding, and I am going to get myself back to the actual parable, but this is really good stuff, right? Is that you've got the king, that's God. You've got his son, that's Jesus. And you're saying, well, who's wedding? Who's he marrying? The church, us. It's showing that this is a relationship that's not just, you know, it's not just friends, it's intimate, right? And it's connected, and it's stitched together by God, right? Okay, and so if that's the setting, right? If Jesus is saying the kingdom of heaven is like, right? Or the kingdom of God is like, so he's setting up this parable. It's like a wedding banquet, a wedding feast, which is really good because what's the best thing about weddings? is the music, the dancing, the drinking, the eating, right? It's the celebration. It's celebration of this new couple coming together and starting a life together. And God's saying, right, we want to celebrate the life together between Jesus and Jesus' followers, the church. Now, notice something, something really important. Whenever Jesus really wants to talk about celebration, he always talks about meals, there's feasting, there's celebration. Um, this is why um, communion is so important. We think of it in a symbolic way, but it's still a meal, right? It's still, we gather around a table to eat and drink and be strengthened and nourished and to be able to do all the things that God calls us to do. A good party, right? Good barbecue, good picnic, th all of those. Think of all of that. When Jesus wants us to really understand and get what he's talking about when he's talking about us as a community of faith, it's grounded in eating and feasting and celebrating, 
that's really important. I mean, think of it. Um, Jesus' first miracle, what was his first miracle in, in Scripture? Turning water into wine at the marriage feast at Cana, right? First thing Jesus does, he's not even center stage, right? He's enjoying somebody else's wedding. It's a great party. They start running out of wine. The, the couple starts like, oh, my goodness, we're running out. And just like, yeah, don't worry about it. You know, water into wine. And the best stuff that they had. And not just a little bit of it, five massive stone jars of it. Right? They, they had, I mean, this is a wedding that was going to last for days now, right? It would, it would have taken a while, right? But that's the kind of lavishness that Jesus wants to think about it. Think about it. In the parable of the prodigal son, what does the father do to celebrate? Yeah, he, right. He slaughters the fatted calf. He, he throws a party. He throws a big party. That's what the father does when a sinner returns or when a sinner is redeemed, right? You've got the Last Supper itself. The last thing that Jesus does before the whole business of the arrest and the trial and the crucifixion and the resurrection is sitting down at the table with his disciples saying, do this, right? And then even after Jesus is resurrected, he has an evening meal on the road to Emmaus. He even has a breakfast of broiled fish by the lake with his disciples, and they still had no idea who he was until he ate with them and read scripture to them. And they're like, oh, it was Jesus all along. And of course, it's like, yes, it was. <laughs> but always in that very, because there's nothing more earthy and tangible than feasting, than eating, right? It's when we sit around the table and we tell stories. The good and the bad, the, what's that? Yeah, that's right. That's exactly right, Claire. We toss back and we, we just, and, and, and this is when, you know, we're at our most relaxed, our most open, our most jovial, right? You know, when you think of great moments in your life, a lot of them are going to be around the dinner table, Right? Jesus knows that. Jesus knows how important that is because there's something rich and lavish about feasting, right? Sometimes, even if it's just, you know, the, the chicken wings and fries that you picked up because you didn't have time to cook that night, right? But you know what? Those never taste better than when you've been busy all day and you have no time to cook and you get home and you've got a little box of wings and you're like, oh, this is perfect. Okay, that was last night with Denise and I. I was just saying, you know, we were, both of us were like, do you want to cook? No, I don't want to cook. Would you just pick something up? Yes, absolutely, right? But sometimes after, you know, and you sit back and you eat and you talk and you share stories and you are in relationship with one another. And that's what this is all about, which is why this story, when it takes its turn, feels really uncomfortable to us because this is going to go south really fast, Right? So God is sending everybody out. Go give everybody the invitation. Just dole them out, right? Everybody comes. And there's the problem. And I want you to, all that, all that feasting and all that imagery, the relationship building, I want you to keep it tucked in the back of your mind because God is happy, right? God wants to celebrate with us. God wants us to engage and come to the party and be filled, Right? extends invitations to everybody to celebrate. And then something weird happens. Because people say, nah, I don't want to go. They reject the invitation. Right? And you're thinking, why on earth would you do that? Right? And they make excuses. Oh, I got to go to my farm. I got something in my business. And then it starts, you know, and we're thinking, okay, so in a parable, Jesus isn't just telling a story. Who are these people that are rejecting the invitation? Well, what do you think? What do you think this is? Jesus is making a very clear point, and it's, and it's an important one. So if, right, God, Jesus the wedding, you know, being married to the church, sending out invitations that are being rejected. Who, who is Jesus talking about, do you think? 
sinners, yes, but a very specific group of sinners. Um, in this case, because, and their sin is very particular. Because their sin, I'll just give that away. The sin is the rejection of the invitation, right? They're just like, oh, why would I want to do that? So who is it, think of during Jesus' time, that is rejecting something, rejecting the son, right? Who is that? Well, yeah, some of the chosen people, Jackie, exactly right. And specifically, the leaders of his chosen people. So we're talking about the religious authorities who should know better, right? They've been looking for a Messiah since the prophet said there was going to be a Messiah that was going to return, right? And so there's a group of people who are incredibly hostile to Jesus during his life, right? Not just the Romans, they're indifferent. They don't care. But we're talking about the religious authorities of Jesus' own community. Pharisees, Sadducees, any of them. Even the kings of Israel, right? You know, think of Herod and all the rest. You know, think of all these people who should know better. They're, they refuse the invitation because they are incredibly hostile to Jesus' interpretation of Scripture, his understanding of God, his understanding of the coming of the Messiah, right? Because they say, you know, Jesus, they freak out the most when Jesus says, the one you're looking for, that's me. And they're like, oh, no, that couldn't possibly be, right? Because that, that's what is getting under them. And so what Jesus is saying is that the, the invitation's going out to everybody, I mean, everybody. And these people are saying, no, we'd rather not. And he, he actually is even prefiguring the, his death at their hands because, right, they send out slaves or servants to let them know, and they mock them, they beat them, they kill them, right? This is an understanding that, you know, God has done this before. God has sent messengers out into the world. We call them prophets, right? Trying to get people to do the right thing, pointing them in the right direction, giving them the invitation to God's heavenly banquet, God's riches, right? And, and you, all you have to do, right, is say thank you. <laughs> That's it, right? I mean, there's the thing is that um, Jesus is saying that God's done all the work. God has done the saving, right? God has done the finding. You just got to come and sit, have a seat at the table, right? Just come and show up. That's it, right? This is the, this is the easiest invitation you'll ever get. And there's, and there's God just, you know, spreading them out. And people are like, oh, no, thanks. That's all right, right? And that's, and that's really odd, right? They make light of the invitation. They make excuses to be somewhere else. They seize the slaves. They beat them. They kill them. And you're thinking, okay, but Jesus, if they didn't want to go to a party, just don't go, right? That's the, only, the thing that always, you know, gets me going on this particular story is that I always, you know, it's like, okay, you know, there's sometimes when you're like, oh, that's a nice invitation, but man, I really... <laughs> really don't want to go, right? I can't get myself all dressed up and go out, or even if it's just a barbecue that I just have to show up in my t-shirt and shorts, you know, that's a lot of work. I mean, I got to get my car, I got to drive there. I mean, honestly, it's right. And so, but okay, so you get the invitation and you're like, oh, I'm sorry, I don't know what happened to it, you know? But they, that's not good enough for these people. No, 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 no. What Jesus is saying is that it's not enough just to reject the invitation. They've got to insult the one who sent them. They got to abuse the one who brought the invitation, right? They're the ones who, you know, yeah, definitely kill the messenger. And, and, and Jesus is trying to make a point as painfully clear as possible, right? Because remember, again, Jesus is really concerned that all the lessons that we've learned, we've learned badly. And so he's going to ramp up the drama of this to get us out of the rut that we're in, right? Because we still have a tendency to think that we know it all, that we figured it all out. And so we sit in our little rut, in our ditch, and we're like, oh, I know everything, 
you know, I can see those two walls, and I can see the sky above me. That's, that's my world. That's what I get. And Jesus is like, man, there's a whole wide world out there that you've never seen. So he's going to tell these stories to essentially make us so uncomfortable that we get out of those ruts. Jesus knows he's got to push us to the point where we're like, I don't understand anything. And Jesus is like, right, finally you got it. <laughs> you don't. So let me tell you what it is. And so he's got to continually push them. So not only does he make, in the story, the recipients of the invitation, the worst people ever, he also says, what does the king do? Sends troops to kill them and burn down the city. You don't want an invitation? Great. Here they come. You get nothing. Right? And, and, it's, and you're thinking, that's really harsh. Jesus, what are you pointing at? I mean, that's really severe. Just because I rejected an invitation, God's going to come and just mow us all down? Right? I mean, that's not the God that we learn about in Sunday school. Right? And so, and so the question is, why this ferocity in this story? Well, again, remember, this is a story. It's a parable. He's not saying that this thing happened or that it's going to happen. He's trying to get us to see that the problem with the people who received the invitations but rejected them and actually were violent against those who brought the invitation, the real problem is, is that um, these are people who should have known better. They knew scripture better than anybody. They knew what the prophets had foretold. They knew who Jesus was. But because he was such a threat to them, to their status quo, to the way they did things, right? He was going to upset the apple cart, and they didn't like it. But here's the thing. They still all would have benefited. It's not like they would have lost anything. They, you know, nothing gets lost in all of this. That's great. <laughs> all of a sudden, I feel like I'm in a dentist chair, right? You know, it's like... So Jesus was, the ferocity is amped up against because these are precisely the people who should have been leading people to Jesus. They knew better, right? It's like the elders of a congregation who all of a sudden become the problem or the, the um, impediment to growth, right? Instead of helping the next generation, they're like, you kids don't know anything. You sit down and shut up and we'll take care of it. Right? No, we don't want anything new. Right? And everybody's like, hey, that's a little too close to home there, Pastor. You might as well. You know. But I do the same thing. It's like, ah, oh, we've never done it like that before. And, you, and we get, because we're in our trenches, right? We're in our ruts. We're so comfortable in them. And what they're saying is that, but sometimes you got to look at it differently. Right? We do. And Jesus is saying that, you know, you people, you, you're... You're the generation that should be leading people to Jesus. You know all, you got this all, and, and, and not only are you not just not doing that, you're actively working against it. And that's a real problem. That's a real problem. And so Jesus, make, he just cranks up the tension of this story because he really wants us to understand how big of a deal this is. This isn't a minor thing. They are not just undermining this new nascent community, this new church that's being birthed. They're essentially driving people away from God's grace, right? Actively working against God. That's what they're doing. And Jesus is saying, no. If you want to know what hell is, that's what it is, driving people away. Because they're driving them into nothing. Hell isn't punishment. Hell is separation from God, if we think about it. It's just, it's a way that I think about, right? And others have, have done as well. But I find that this is the, the, um, the most crushing thing that you could possibly imagine is separation from God. You don't need punishment at that point. That is the punishment. That is hell, right? Um, it's, it's that eternal separation. And these people are doing it willingly. 
They're running away from God as fast as their legs will take them. And, and, they're, and they're not making it easy on anybody else. In fact, they're attacking those who do follow. And that's what Jesus is trying to get at. And all of a sudden, this parable starts to carry a lot more weight because he really wants them to see it, right? But see, then we have to ask ourselves the question, why don't they see it? And they don't see it because they don't want to see it. Because it means that they're going to have to give some of their control over to God. <laughs> For those at home, I'll let that one go uncommented on. <laughs> but, 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 but it's the, it's the, God has given them a way. And it's his way. But because it's not their way, they don't want it. Right? Pride. Yeah, exactly, Claire. Pride is just blocking them, right? They thought it was their birthright. They thought all they had to do was be born to it. And Jesus is essentially saying, well, you were, and, and God did that. You just got to recognize that God is the one who does this for you. And they're like, but wait a minute, that takes some control away from me. And Jesus is like, oh, well, come on. I mean, honestly, it's, you know. And so Jesus reminds them that without God's grace, there's no party. There's no wedding without God. There's no barbecue. There's no picnic, right? He's the one who set it up. He's the one who made it. He's the one who laid the table. He put everything out there, and he's the one who set the invitation out, right? Okay, and Jesus still isn't done with this story. He still wants to turn it on its head and get us really thinking. And so he tells the servants, go back out into the streets, Collect everybody. And this is really important. This is really important. This is one of those things that we can glide past really fast. And, and this is the, so in verse 10, look in verse 10. Those slaves went out into the streets and gathered all whom they found, both good and bad. Right? And this is really important. They're not just looking for the good people. They'll take everybody. Right? The invitation is for everybody. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. Exactly. We can't rush past this too fast, right? Notice something that is a pretty common thread in the parables. When Jesus tells parables, he's not about the business of saying that there's people outside the kingdom and people inside the kingdom. Everybody's just in the kingdom. Whether you're good or bad, you're in the kingdom. So the parable of the sower, right? There's good soil, there's rocky soil, and there's a path. But you know what? They all get seeds, right? They all get seeds thrown on them. In um, the parable of the wheat and the weeds, right? Everything grows up together. God will take care of it later. But they're all in the kingdom. The prodigal son, the good Samaritan, the Pharisee, and the publican. Um, one of the biblical scholars, um, Robert Capon, says, Jesus is going out of his way to make heroes out of life's losers. Jesus is collecting up everybody, right? I mean, you think about um, the prodigal son. Both sons are terrible, right? They really are. And Jesus is like, yeah, okay, they're in. They're part of the party, right? And so... Good or bad isn't the problem. You're a part of the kingdom. The only problem for Jesus, and we see it in this parable, the only problem is those who just don't accept that God has solved the whole in and out problem. Right? And so they say to God, you say everybody's in? Oh, then I don't want it. Right? Right? because then I don't get to pick who's in. Their pride, Claire, and I think that's such an important word, right? Stubbornness is a word that we could use. My mom's favorite phrase was bullheaded, right? And she always said, we're stubborn and bullheaded, you know? And like, well, isn't that the same thing, mom? She goes, no, trust me. You'll see that there's a difference, <laughs> right? And so... But And we're so, we so want to control who's in or out, and Jesus is saying everybody's in. 
And these people are like, fine, then I don't want it. Right? They will walk away from grace rather than accept the fact that God's in charge and that God lets everybody in. I know a person right now who their biggest frustration is that the idea that God forgives all people. Oh, no, 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 no. That can't possibly be. There are certain people that God will never forgive. Well, I don't seem to recall. I mean, you know. But, but people really want that, right? They want to be able to say there are good people and there are bad people, and the bad people are going to be punished. And if you say that everybody's good, well, then that can't be right. Right? There's something about radical inclusion that really gets people's go- you know, goat. They really don't like that. Oh, no, those, those people, and however it's defined, right? I mean, you're all in the generation that you saw it happening during civil rights, right? When all of a sudden, you know, the, the temerity of black people to drink from the same drinking fountain, and for some white people, that was like, oh, no, we can't have that at all. Right? And they're still around. Right? And there's a lot of them. And they're, you know, but I, and I will never understand this because it's like, but it's because it's too inclusive. It's too big. It's too diverse. It's too rich. It's too beautiful. And God says, yeah, but I made all of you. What are you talking about? You're all mine. And all I'm just saying is, you're all mine. And these people are like, no, don't want it. I'll, I'd rather walk away from that. And then the other part of it is, not only are you including everybody, you're saying that God did all the work, that all I have to do is sit down and enjoy the feast. And that really messes with, especially modern-day American Christians, because everything that we do is based on economy, right? If I do this, then I get that. If I work hard, then I'll be rewarded, right? It's the American way. And and Jesus is saying, and would say to us modern-day Christians, especially in America, okay, that may be the American way, but that's not my way. Everybody's in. I did the work. Right? Period. Simple as that. And you know what? People don't like that. They don't like it because everybody gets in and, but, but what do you mean they didn't have to earn it, right? I mean, we have, we have people right now who get frustrated that, you know, we're too generous with Social Security. Anytime they call it an entil- entitlement, it just drives me crazy. You're not an, it's not an entitlement. You worked for it, right? You're, not, you're just getting money that you put into the system. Entitlement, Right? But it's because they're so afraid that somebody's going to get something for nothing. And that somebody that they don't like is going to get anything. Right? Oh, the last thing. I mean, you talk to some people, the last thing they want. You know, you can have full and, you know, complete integration into society, but just don't do anything. Don't take anything. Don't, Don't benefit in any way. Right? I mean, that's what you know, the, the white supremacists, you know, their biggest frustration is the fact that, you know, somewhere, somewhere, a black person might be happy and living a contented life and, and doing the same things that they do. Oh, no, I can't have that. What do you mean? That, you know, and, 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 that's, and that's what Jesus is dealing with here. But think of it at the whole cosmic scale, right? I mean, Good or bad, you're invited, right? The invitation's yours. Just come to the party. And here's the thing. We always wonder what God's judgment is. And we always think that God's judgment in this story comes at the end when he's kicking people out or when he's, when he's telling people. No, you know what the judgment is? The judgment, <laughs> the invitation's the judgment. Right? The invitation's the judgment. When God says, here you go, you're in. He's judged you. That's the judgment. And that grace is too much for some people. I I know I've told this story before. There's a person that if Denise and I ever actually won the lottery, Denise has a friend of hers that her life was so based on economy. 
If I do this, then I do that, right? Everything. I mean, if you gave her a ride to work, she knew, she would write it into her book that she owed you a ride to work someday. Just everything was economy. And Denise says, if we ever play the, the lottery and win, she wants to write her a check for $10,000 anonymously and just say, it's a gift, right? Just because. And it would probably make her mind go, right? What do you mean? It's just, I, now I owe, no, it's, it's just pure grace, pure grace. It's just a gift. Do with it whatever you want. You want to burn it? Fine. You want to do something with it? Doesn't matter, right? It's just pure grace. And we have a hard time with grace. And clearly, Jesus understood they did too. But the point that God is trying to make is that it is grace. The invitation is the judgment, right? You get the card you're in, and everybody got a card, right? Everybody's invited to the barbecue. Everybody, right? You're in. You're good. Now, that doesn't mean that God doesn't have some ground rules. You know, you're in. That's great. Now you got to live a certain way, right? But that's just for good order. That's just because God wants us to actually live with one another and, and for that to make sense, right? And so once you're in the party, yeah, there's some ground rules, right? And what we see is one of the ground rules is that they got to have a wedding robe, right? Now, here's the thing. What they really don't say, but is clearly um, beneath the, behind the story, is that God's the one doling out the wedding robes, right? It's not like they had to go find one. God set them up, right? You've got the robe, you've got the food, just go eat, go celebrate. And then we get this guy who doesn't have a wedding garment, right? And now here's the thing. You're in the party. Just go with God's flow, right? That, that's all you have to do. So what do we do with this guy without the wedding robe, right? Because this is a strange turn of the whole story. Well, we don't know why he didn't have a garment, but it's more important than his lack of a garment is something else. And it says it right in the text. He's speechless, right? When they ask him, where's your garment? He doesn't say a word, does he? Doesn't say a word. Now, this is the thing that it just, it always, you know, it should. It should make you go, why is that? That's so strange, right? I mean, if it's me, I'm like, oh, I don't know. I don't know what happened to it. You know, you make some kind of connection. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And even if you didn't have one, they would have them. Have you ever been to a nice restaurant where they have suit coats for men? If or ties, right, exactly, yeah, that's exactly it. You walk in, and if, you, if you're not properly attired, they're like, done. A good place will do that. Bad places will just kick you out. Those are terrible. But I've been to a place, you know, and this is a while ago, and it was one of the first times that I went to a fancy restaurant. I had no idea. I didn't have a suit. I didn't, I didn't own one, right? And the guy's like, he goes, well, here's a jacket. It was the first time I'd ever worn a, a blazer. I was, I don't know, 18, 19 years old and stuff like that. I had no idea. It was a college thing, you know. Okay, we're all going to take you out to uh, this dinner. I'm just like, never been to a place this nice, ever, right? I mean, my folks are so solidly middle class that, you know, we thought Red Lobster was the, the epitome of fine dining, right? That, and we did that maybe once every three years. It was just one of those things. So we went to this place, and they're like, do you have a jacket? I'm like, no, <laughs> why would I have one? They gave me one right? That's what's going on here. Back then, they did the same thing. You don't have a wedding robe? Fine. We got you. We're good. Why? Because we want you to be in the party. But this guy didn't have one, which meant, well, we don't know, right? It's, it's the whole thing. But why he doesn't have one is less important the fact that when confronted by the king's servants, he doesn't say a word which meant probably that he didn't want to wear it, that he didn't want to accept the conditions, any conditions, even as simple as put on a jacket, right? But he didn't even argue with them. If he had argued with them, he would have been fine. But it's because he's speechless. 
he does not relate to the king or the king's people in any way. He stays silent. He cuts off all communication, and that seals his fate. It's because of that lack of communication. He's essentially saying, I don't want to be here. You know, I don't want to accept the conditions for being here. I mean, but think of it. You see grace just laid out in front of you, and all you have to do is put on the robe that everybody else is wearing, right? It's not like you have to stop being who you are. You just have the right shirt on. And that was a bridge too far for this guy. But even then, even if he had said, I don't like the color of the gown, I don't like this, I don't like that, I, I, feel, I feel self-conscious, right? You know, I, I don't know, I just feel weird. Anything, he says nothing. And that lack of communication is a rejection of everything that the king was offering. The lack of communication is just absolutely central. Think of what a pain in the backside the older brother is in the story of the prodigal son, right? Why are you throwing a party for him? I've always been so good. I just, you know, I'm always here. I'm dutiful. He whines like a sib only a sibling can do when another sibling is involved. They, he whines, but you know what? He's still in relationship with the father, right? He still talks to the father, he still has that relationship. It may be a little fractured, but it exists. When you remain silent, you wall yourself off from God. Yeah, but you know what? God's not the one who's going to throw you into the outer darkness. You did that to yourself. Now, in this, he gets punished, right? He gets thrown into outer darkness where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth, which I just love that phrase, right? I just love that phrase, right? But make no mistake, right? And again, this is where we come back to it. Hell isn't the punishment of sinners. It's the rejection of God. You're separate from God, not because God moved, but because you ran the other way. You ran as fast as your feet would take you. You cut that relationship. God was there at, at, still at the very end, right? Where's your robe, right? That's not somebody who is like, he doesn't kick him out and then ask, you know, or, 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 you know, or make the decision. He kicks him out after the guy says nothing, after the guy has separated himself from God. And then we come to this last line, this last line that really starts to eat at us, right? Because the whole thing has been hard. It's been hard, and now we're stuck with this last one, right? Because then the king said to the attendants, bind him hand and foot, and throw him into the outer darkness where there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. And we're like, ah, wait a minute, pastor, you've been saying that everybody's invited, Right? You've been saying everybody, good and bad. So how do you square that with the rest? Let me see if I can try. <laughs> this may not be the most satisfying answer, but it's the one I've got today, right? It's a statement about the fact that for far too many people, when they're given the invitation to God's party, free of charge, they decide they don't want to go. God's doling out the invitations. But there are a lot of people who just can't get past the fact that God is doing the inviting, and therefore we have to play by God's rules, and that he's letting everybody in. And so a lot of people just say, yep, I'm out. I'm out. They hem and haw about what's going to happen. Maybe they don't like the food. They don't like the music. They certainly don't like all the company, right? and they decide it's not worth their time or their effort. And a lot of it is because we don't trust grace. Right? It's been so ingrained in our heads. There's no such thing as a free lunch. Right? We always think, yeah, where is the, when the other shoe going to drop? What's the, what's the catch? 
And God's out there screaming at us, there's no catch. There's no catch. You're in. Because I love you, because you're my creation and I want you in. You're in. And we're like, yeah, I don't trust you, God. You've got something up your sleeve, right? And because we think God's got something up his sleeve, we say no. We walk away. It's not based on economy, right? It's not this for that. And so we think it can't possibly be okay. There's no such thing as a free lunch. And God's saying, okay, how about a free banquet? And we're like, yeah, no, that's all right. No, no. We're so consumed by that that we're willing to walk away. We're willing to sever that relationship. Right? But there's Jesus saying, even with the harshness of the story, it's grace all the way down. God's the one who invited you in the first place. God made the banquet, right? All the good food, all the good stuff, all the people, all the, that's God. God did all of that. And God's saying, you're in. And a lot of people are like, yep, nope. They can't. They just can't believe it. They won't believe it. And they won't believe it because it's offered for free. And so, they don't go. And then, and this is always what happens, they wonder where God went. Right? And they get angry because God removed himself from them. When God is saying, you were the one who ran away from me as fast as your legs would take you. Right? Many are called. God calls everybody. And a lot of people just walk away because they can't believe it. They can't accept it in their minds that this is the way that God works. That's the society. That's, that's, that's where we are. And wrapping our brains around God's grace is always the greatest stumbling block in our lives. It just doesn't make sense. And God's like, right, it doesn't because you're thinking too small. Our vision's too small, right? It's bigger than that. It's as big as God's creation. It's as big as God's love for you, right? And we think, yeah, but, yeah. Right. 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 Yeah, and see, and that's one of that's exactly right. You know, it just that particular part of the story has always kind of go. We we wonder about that because okay, you invited him in. You can't throw him out because he doesn't have. The, yeah, don't throw him out because he's got the wrong outfit on. But see, that's just it. Is that the people at the time would have understood that they would have been given one. You know, they would have been, they would have understood that if they're invited to the wedding and they don't have, because they understand that, especially in the Jewish community, they understood that not everybody was wealthy enough to own the things that they needed to have. And so they would have been given those things. Yeah. Okay. Okay, yeah. <laughs> but but that's the impulse, right? I mean, we're, yeah, yeah. Without having the jacket on, yeah. That's just yeah. And 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 I could see that. You know, people are like, man, I dressed up. This I look good. I don't need to, I don't need a jacket. <laughs> 
but the rules are, you know. And, and the rules that God has, right, it's not rules to get in. It's rules of behavior once you're in. That's the thing, right, is that, you know, you're going to get to heaven, but we've got a life to live, and God has called you to a certain path, right? And, and walking that path, it's not just because you're doing that because God wants you to do it, right? It's not just, you know, because I said so, but because it's good for us that walking God's path actually is going to make things better, not just for us, but everybody around us. Yeah, Jackie. Right, right. Why, why is it important to have on a certain garment? Right. Well, I think because if we're thinking about it in terms of the ancient world, and, and allow me to put on my historian's hat for just a moment, what you wore revealed a lot. Um, and we see this in the ancient world by what colors you could wear depending on your rank, right? And so you wore certain things in certain times as a signifier that you were a part of a group. In this particular case, you put a wedding gown on because you were at a wedding. Um, it's why, it's why I wear clerics, right? It's my uniform. It's so that people automatically know that who's that strange guy walking down the street? Oh, yeah, he must be a, a pastor or a priest, right? It, it automatically lets people know without even saying any, without me saying a word, who I am. Well, if you have invited a bunch of people to a wedding, right, um, how do you keep the gate crashers out? Everybody come. Well, right. Right, right. But think of this less as, because that's a really good point, Jackie, that, you know, aren't we supposed to just come as we are? Aren't we supposed to, it, God's not putting conditions on entrance. And it's not a condition of entrance. It's a condition of being there right? It's, you're in, but now there are certain standards. And so think of it, we're in, right? But God still wants us to follow the Ten Commandments. Those are conditions. Those are conditions for being in, in the community, right? It makes the kingdom work better, right? It makes the community work better. And so that's, the, that's always the thing, is that we have to set aside that there are two things going on here. There's, there's salvation, which God has taken care of, and then there's what we call sanctification, which is us getting closer to what God has called us to do. Well, that's work that we have to do. There are things that we have to do. And in, in, a, in a way to illustrate that in the story, Jesus is saying, everybody's got to put a robe on. Now, is this saying that there are dress codes for church or anything like that? No, that's not what he's saying. But he, what he's saying is that once you're in, you've got to do the following. And one of those, and the, the only following thing that they had to do was wear the robe. Now, here's the thing, and I'll get to your question, because I think this is um, something that I find to be, it's not the lack of the robe that's the problem. It's the fact that he didn't say anything. It's the fact that he stopped engaging with the king or the king's representatives. That was the problem. If he had said, oh, I don't know, I mislaid it, or I don't have one, right? If he had said that, I'm going to guess that Jesus would say he's still in. It's his speechlessness. It's not engaging with the king or the king's representative that's far more problematic, far more problematic than the lack of a robe, right? They came up to him, they saw that he looked different, and they said, where's your robe? And instead of saying, I don't know, I got too close to a torch and it went poof, it's gone. Or I, it's terrible, did you look at these things? There's no style at all, right? <laughs> like the guy, no, I'm not going to wear a jacket. You know, but, but he doesn't do that. He doesn't say anything. And that's the problem. D does that make sense? He does not engage, right? That's, that's the issue. It's, it's not the lack of the robe that's really the problem. 
is the fact that he won't engage. Because that's a, there's a tacit admission. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, maybe. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, you, you would cover your head in church. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was one of those things that you used to do. And still, I mean, it's perfectly... Sure, sure. Oh, yeah, I mean, it's, and it's a sign of respect, right? It's a, it's a sign of respect, um, more so than anything else. It's not a requirement, but it's something that you do as a way of saying, I'm in God's house, and so I'm going to act differently or I'm going to do my level best to act at my best, you know, in that kind of situation. So, yeah, I mean, I think that's, that's a part of it, too. Um, but here's the best thing about this, right? The way Jesus tells this parable has got you thinking, hasn't it? <laughs> right? I mean, it's got us churning and thinking and figuring out, okay, what's really, what, what's important? Is it the robe or is it something else? Um, who's in, who's out, the invitation, grace? All of those things are things that before reading this, we would have been like, oh, no, I know exactly how it all works. And we would have put it in the framework that we understand. And Jesus is like, you don't get it, so let me, kill, let me give you a story that's just going to completely open you up to questions and concerns and discussion and debate. And here's the best thing. Everybody's comments, Jackie, you're, you know, the things that you're saying, I honestly don't know if I'm, what I'm saying is right. This is, this is my best educated exploration. But the most important thing that Jesus would be like, good, you know, mission accomplished, is that we're talking about it at all that all of a sudden we're thinking about, what does God's grace look like? And that's what he means. When he's saying, the kingdom of God is like, right? When he's saying, you know, the kingdom of God is like, what he is saying is, this is what God's grace looks like. This is what the kingdom is, is supposed to be. And, and God has invited you into it, right? And so we should be a little bit discombobulated by the parables. That's why Jesus tells them the way he does. He wants us to think it through, to work on it, to wrestle with it, to mull, to discern, to pray about it, right? Jesus wants all of this because that's what makes us grow. And ultimately, that's what Jesus wants. The stories aren't just a way for people to say, aha, you're out. <laughs> it's for Jesus to get us to grow in our faith and to grow in our understanding of what God's kingdom looks like, what it is, what it does, right? Remember, and I think this is really important, Jesus is first and foremost, not just, I mean, son of God, yes, but a really good rabbi, Right? He's a really good rabbi. And what does a rabbi do? They teach. They teach about God's kingdom. Jesus' ministry, his life, his death, his resurrection, is a way to get us to understand, even a little bit, what God's grace means for us. And then how we can live out of that grace. These are amazing stories because they're not just stories. But Jesus is so adept at doing all of this that 2,000 years later, we are still grinding our way through these and, and, being, and things are being revealed to us through the opening of Scripture, through our conversations, you know, because you're never going to think about this parable without thinking, or when you're sitting at a table, or you go to a wedding, or you go to any kind of banquet, and the next time we have a barbecue, or the next time we do a fish fry out here, we're going to think about, wait a minute. And that's what Jesus wants to do. That's what he's pulling on. And so that's good stuff. Um, really good stuff. I love it. Um, next week, speaking of good stuff, we're going to do the parable of the Good Samaritan. Because... I haven't made things 
too complicated as it is, and so we're going to dive right into that. So next week, um, Parable of the Good Samaritan, um, for those of you who have been watching us online today, thank you. So good to be with you, um, good to be a part of the conversation and uh, in our engagement together. Um, again, if you ever have questions, um, you can always put them in the comments um, or you can ask me afterwards. Um, that works just as well. We'll see you again next Wednesday for Bible study at 1215. But also, um, don't forget, um, church here at Genesis is 10 o'clock. It's St. James, it's 1015. And if I'm remembering, because we now have folks from St. Paul's probably as well, that's at 930. And all that's going to change next year anyway for you guys. But um, so, um, don't forget, um, this Sunday, um, we celebrate the... Sacrament of Holy Baptism for Amir Watts. Um, I believe he turns three on the same day. So it's his birthday and his baptism day. So that's going to be a lot. Of, that's going to be just a joy. Um, so, yes, I did not write that down. So I will get that to you, Claire. Thank you. What was the chapter and verse for, um, to, for the Good Samaritan? Yes, um, I think your assignment can be, you get to look that up. <laughs> I think it's in, um, well, <laughs> so thank you, everybody. Thank you for um, coming out today, and we'll see you on Sunday for worship. Thanks, everybody.